just a few few slides of recap everything's in the previous video so i'm not going to labor this but just to recap the topic area we're considering sin cylinders okay from our previous lecture and don't forget the uh, classification for a thin cylinder is that the diameter to thickness ratio the d upon t ratio must be greater than or equal to 20. all right that's key for what we're doing okay and then this theory we're using here this applies quite accurately um, and what's nice about this it, it means it's also relatively simple to use you'll see when we come to thick cylinders it's a bit more complicated because we we have we have much smaller d upon t ratios and the assumptions we make here are not applicable there so this is a classical approach to considering a sin cylinder. So we're assuming that the cylinder we're looking at is remote from the ends of a, of a pipeline, for example, not near the flanges, or there's no discontinuities associated with the bit of pipe we're looking at. So we're away from any stress concentration effects, effectively, that could affect the stress patterns. We're also assuming with this theory that there's no variation of the hoop stress across the thickness of the vessel wall. So across this thickness here, the hoop stress shown here, we're assuming is constant across there. It's not quite right, but it's it's good enough for what we need for this type of cylinder. So in other words, the whole cylinder, the wall of the cylinder, acts like a membrane, acts like a balloon. You think of how a balloon reacts, the pressure inside of it by pure tension, then effectively, and that's how we could consider a syn cylinder of aluminium alloy or steel or whatever, to react the internal pressure. It's in pure tension, uh, is a hoop stress, and of course has a longitudinal stress that we mentioned last week. I'm just recapping here the formulae that we derived last week. So if you want to see the proof for those are in last week's video. These are the maximum direct stresses in a vessel wall. So in a cylinder, let's consider a cylinder first of all, we have a hoop stress, a hoop failure. And that formula was hoop stresses, the PD upon 2T, P being the internal pressure, D being a diameter. And as I said last week, we're not really concerned if it's the internal diameter, the external diameter, or the mean diameter, because the wall thickness is so thin, that really doesn't matter to the formula we're using. And T, of course, is the wall thickness. So PD upon 2T is the hoop stress shown there in the vessel wall. We mentioned last week the cylinder's longitudinal stress and failure, longitudinal failure, longitudinal stress. So the longitudinal stress sigma L is PD upon 40 we proved in our formula last week. So that fails in this manner shown here. So PD upon 40 is the longitudinal stress. And we did also mention the stress in a sphere or a hemisphere, half a sphere, um, so it's like a donut, a broken donut there, but that's supposed to be a sphere. And we, we proved that in the hemisphere or the sphere, the hoop stress is actually PD upon 40. The hoop stress is always PD upon 40. So it's half the hoop stress in a cylinder. And that's why you sometimes see you know, spherical vessels used. We've got very high pressures. It reduces stress in the walls and the welds. And also you sometimes see domed ends of pressure cylinders. And again, that's to reduce the stresses um, at the ends of the vessel. We did also mention last week maximum shear stresses. And again, we didn't quite have all the theory to fully understand how they're derived because they're derived from a more stress circle. But just to be aware of the formulae, the maximum shear stress in a cylinder was shown to be PD upon 40 um, in our cylinder. That's the maximum shear stress. It's the radius of a more stress circle. And if we consider in a sphere or a hemisphere, the maximum shear stress is shown to be PD upon 8T, which again is shown to be PD upon 80, that's sort of the radius of that circle. Okay, so just be aware of those, that's all. And also, just recap from last week, we mentioned the factor of safety, the maximum allowable stress over the uh, permissible or the working stress uh, produces the factor of safety. We'll see that factor of safety will crop up again in some of the questions this week, um, factors of safety to apply to the ultimate strengths or the yield strength, whatever they're given in the question. So that will crop up in some of the questions you'll see. 
I'm going to introduce now some a little more notation, a little more terminology here, and also a few more derivations of formulae. But there's not much here. I want to spend most of the time in this lecture you really engaging with the question. So I'm going to try and overview this very quickly here. Let's go through what's called joint efficiency here. So most pressure vessels are constructed from flat plates, uh, which tend to be rolled to the correct radius and then welded along the seams to form the pressure vessel shell shown below in the sketch. So we have both circumferential and longitudinal welds in our cylindrical vessel wall. And that's what's shown here, it's showing a little rolling direction of our plate here. And we've got a longitudinal weld, if I show it here, it's a longitudinal weld, okay, and we also can have a circumferential weld shown around here. What we've got to be careful of with welds is the efficiency of the welded joints because they depend on the post-weld heat treatments that are undertaken um, used to relieve stresses and also the amount of non-destructive testing that's performed. So the more non-destructive testing is performed, the higher the efficiency of the weld will be. So efficiency, symbol eta usually used for efficiency of the welded joints, should be accounted for within the stress analysis of all pressure vessels. Now efficiency generally range between 65% and 100%, of course. So be careful if it gives you a percentage of efficiency of sort of 95%, that's 0.95. Be careful how you use that in the in the formula. So joint efficiency can be accounted for in the hoop stress formula as shown below. The only thing that's different now between this formula for hoop stress in a cylinder, sigma h here, instead of being PD upon 2t, as it was in the previous lecture, it's now stated as PD upon 2t multiplied by the efficiency of the longitudinal joint. Now just be careful there. What that equation is uh, emphasizing is that the hoop stress in the vessel wall is dependent on the longitudinal weld. So the weld along this section here affects the hoop stress because the hoop stress pulls on the longitudinal weld. Just be careful there. In the longitudinal, in the hoop stress, the longitudinal weld efficiency is used. Similarly, if we consider longitudinal stress in a cylinder, sigma L, last week that was PD upon 40 in our lecture. This week it's PD upon 40, but multiplied by the efficiency of the hoop weld, the circumferential weld. So again, if we look at the uh, little diagram there, we've got our longitudinal stress here, and that acts on the area of the circumferential section, okay, or the uh, circumferential joint there. So, so be careful when we're using the hoop stress, we have to use a longitudinal weld efficiency when we calculate the longitudinal stress, we use the circumferential, the hoop stress weld efficiency. Just be careful of that in the formula. But that's the only difference between last week's formulae and this week's for calculating the hoop stresses and longitudinal stress in the cylinder. We just have introduced the weld efficiency into the equation. Example one. Let's just briefly outline this because it does bring in weld efficiencies. So a mild steel oxygen storage bottle is to be designed for a maximum pressure of 136 bar. If the cylindrical portion has an internal diameter of 305 millimeters, we've got to calculate the minimum required thickness of the wall to the nearest millimeter. If the ultimate tensile strength of the steel is 450 meganewtons per meter squared and a factor of safety of 4 is to be applied. If non-DT inspection is undertaken on all the welds, we can assume that the weld efficiencies are 95%. So they're indicating that the weld efficiencies for the longitude and the hoop directions are the same efficiency, 95%. The top of the cylinder is made in the shape of a hemisphere. So we've got to calculate the thickness of this hemisphere, uh, again required to the nearest millimeter. And then we've got to determine the maximum shear stress present within the bottle if it's fabricated from the above thicknesses. Okay, so that's the outline of the question there. I've worked this for you, so I seem to really take down here. Um, just a slight, um, slight difference in the way it's presented, I think, here, that's all. 
Okay, as with all these questions, do be careful. Lots of information, lots of different units used. I can see the pressure is in terms of bar, for example, straight away. So we need to convert that. I've shown my unity bracket for conversion here. So 136 bar is 13.6 mega newtons per meter squared, or of course it's 13.6 mega pascals if you want to use pascals. The diameter in the question was given in terms of millimeters. So I've converted it to meters here. I'm going to use everything in meters. And my weld efficiency was given given as 95% uh, and I put that in terms of 0.95 and that's the same for both of the directions hoop and longitudinal here. They also said that the factor of safety of 4 is to be applied so I've got my factor of safety of 4. It's applied in this case to the ultimate tensile strength that's the maximum allowable stress so 450 mega newtons per meter squared given in the question for the UTS. So applying our factor of safety there the working stress would be the ultimate uh, stress divided by the factor of safety. So that works out to be 112.5 mega newtons per meter squared. That's the stress level we can see in everyday occurrence. We Example one continued. Calculate the required thickness of the cylinder. We will need to consider the maximum stress in the cylinder, which of course is the hoop stress. So the hoop stress is PD upon 2T multiplied by the E to L. E to L being the weld efficiency in the longitudinal direction shown here. And rearranging for thickness T, the equation becomes PD over 2 multiplied by the hoop stress multiplied by the weld efficiency. So from the previous slide, we know the pressure is 13.6 times 10 to the 6 pascals. The diameter is 0 0.305 meters. And that's divided by 2 multiplied by the working stress, 112.5 times 10 to the 6 newtons per meter squared and that's multiplied by the weld efficiency of 0.95. That evaluates to produce a thickness of 0.0194 meters, which is 19.4 millimeters. To the nearest millimeter, we must use 20 millimeters. Mathematically, of course, we would round 19.4 down to the nearest millimeter to make 19. But because of the context here, if we use 19 millimeters, we would actually then exceed the working stress level we calculated on the previous page so we cannot do that so in this case we have to round up to 20 millimeters and if we want to determine the thickness of the spherical end again we must consider the maximum stress in the spherical end and we know from our previous lecture the stress in the spherical end is the same in all directions and it's the hoop stress this time defined as pd upon 40 eta h the weld efficiency in the hoop direction Again, rearranging for thickness T, that's PD upon 4 sigma H, E to H. Again, the weld efficiency is 0 0.95. Inserting the values, noting that we're dividing by 4 this time, not 2 as above, that evaluates to 0 0.0097 metres, 9.7 millimetres, so to the nearest millimetre that would be 10 millimetres. So the wall thickness of our cylinder is 20 millimeters and the wall thickness of our spherical end is 10 millimeters. Sample one continued. We're then asked to calculate the maximum shear stress in the cylinder. No, no weld efficiency applied here on the shear stress calculation. So for the cylinder, the maximum shear stress is PD upon 40. The cylinder wall thickness is 20 millimetres from the previous calculations so of 0.02 metres. Evaluating the cylinder shear stress is 51.9 mega newtons per metre squared. And finally, calculating the maximum shear stress in the spherical end. The maximum shear stress is PD upon 8T from our previous lecture. In this case, the thickness of the spherical end was 10 millimetres or 0.01 metres. So evaluating, we again get 51.9 mega newtons per meter squared. So, so we have the same shear stress level in the cylinder and spherical end, even though the spherical end is half the thickness of the cylindrical wall, because from the formula for the shear stress in the spherical end, the shear stress is half that of the shear stress in a cylinder. 
To exercise three, a compressed air tank has a diameter of 0.3 meters, a wall thickness of 0.01 meters. We've got to calculate the hoop and longitudinal stresses induced within the shell. And we're given an internal pressure here, 41.5 bar. We're also given the weld efficiencies, so the longitudinal and circumferential weld efficiencies. Longitudinal is 90%. You read the question there, and the circumferential joint efficiency is 65%. It says there, okay. So we've got two different joint efficiencies. We can be careful how we apply them. So that's the question. A cylinder that's uh, an internal pressure um, and has some weld efficiencies to consider in this case. So the first thing to do is get the information out of the question. So we know from the question that the diameter is 0.3 meters and the thickness of the vessel is 0.01 meters. We want to work out the hoop stress. Don't forget the hoop stress will be based on the longitudinal weld efficiency. So when we calculate the longitudinal stress, that will be based on the circumferential weld efficiency. So that's the E to H there. Okay, so so there's the formula. Can I let you put the numbers into the equations? The answers are on the sheet there. Um, just apply the appropriate equations, appropriate values. Notice, go back to what I said last week, sometimes I will use lowercase d for the uh, diameter, sometimes I use capital D, sometimes I use lowercase p for pressure, uppercase e for pressure, sometimes I use lowercase h for hoop in uppercase h for so don't let the com uh, notation confuse you. I do flip between lower and uppercase notation sometimes, but different textbooks you do use different notation. Um, there's the weld efficiency. Don't forget that it's 90% efficiency for the longitudinal weld. So 90% their efficiency for the longitudinal weld. That affects the hoop stress. And it's the 65% efficiency for the um, hoop weld, circumferential weld. And that affects longitudinal stress. Just be careful with that. You apply the appropriate weld efficiencies. There's my calculation. If you want to see my calculations for this particular. Is that okay? I'm hoping you're getting familiar with conversions between bar and megapascals and bar in, say, newtons per millimeter squared or megapascals to newtons per millimeter squared. Hopefully you're getting familiar with those conversions now because they, they, they're the realistic um, issues that crop up in engineering all the time, from my experience anyway. Okay, just a bit of recap again here, going back to what we did a few weeks ago now in our Elastic Constance lecture it was. Just re recapping generalised Hooke's law here. In generalised Hooke's law, we considered direct strains applied to a small element of a piece of material or a structure, and we developed a general triaxial, and that's a 3D stress system. And I've extracted this slide from the, the, that lecture a while ago here. Again, these are all principal stresses here. No shear stresses apply to all principal stresses. What I've tried to do is put this in the context of our thin cylinder theory. So um, I've slightly changed the notation a little bit here to try and comply with what we did in the previous lecture, or what we did in our elastic constant lecture. But hopefully uh, it make a little bit of sense here. If you imagine our thin cylinder wall, and we're going to take out from the wall a very small element. I've shown there's a little dot on the cylinder wall there, but that's we've taken that little cube, if you like, from the cylinder wall. So that, that's a very, very small cube there. If we look at the stresses applied to that particular structure, based on my notation I'm using here, I've got the x direction in the longitudinal direction. Z direction, as I'm showing here, is actually the uh, hoop stress, as it would be shown. So Z is actually my, my hoop stress in this particular case. And the y direction here would be if we had it, would be the radial stress. Yeah, the y would be the radial stress. Now, we know from pre the previous lecture that in thin cylinder theory, we assume the radial stress is negligible compared to the hoop and the longitudinal. It's definitely there, but it tends to be very small in comparison to the uh, other two stresses. Okay, So although the above diagram is showing you a triaxial stress situation, it's showing us that we have a, uh, a stress in the x direction, which would be our longitudinal stress in this particular case. So the longitudinal stress is causing some strain in the x direction. We have have a stress in the y direction but that's negligible here that's going to be very small so I'm just looking for my so in this particular case that's sort of going towards zero because we're assuming the radial stress is zero so we won't have that stress but we do have the hoop stress so we have a Poisson effect of the 
hoop stress in this particular case it's reducing the strain in the x direction so the strain in the z is reducing the strain in the x so we ignore in this case the uh, y stress as it's denoted the y stress would be the radial stress but we do have the hoop stress i've denoted the z in this case so the hoop stress is a z stress so if we apply the previous work on elastic constants for a triaxial situation to a thin cylinder, we actually find we end up with a biaxial situation because in this particular case, we don't have, use notation here, we don't have the Y stress, we don't have the radial stress. So strain in the X direction would be the stress in the X direction divided by E, stress in the X being the longitudinal stress here, minus the Poisson effect back to our previous work on Poisson's ratio, minus the Poisson effect of the stress in the Z, which is actually the hoop stress in this case, divided by E. So we can simplify our triaxial stress situation down to a biaxial stress situation for thin cylinders because we've really only got two stresses of any significant magnitude to, to consider. So let's now consider the dimensional changes in the thin cylinder lengths based on the elastic constant work we looked at on the previous slide. So the dimensional change in length of the cylinder we're looking at here, when it's subject to uh, internal pressure, can be determined from the longitudinal strain, okay? And again, we're making the assumption the radial stress is negligible here. So from our elastic constant work I showed you on the previous slide here, we actually have a biaxial stress situation in this particular case. And noting that the longitudinal stress, of course, is, notice is L here. So the strain in the longitudinal direction, epsilon L, would be the stress in the longitudinal direction divided by E minus the Poisson effect of the stress in the hoop direction divided by E. And that relates to above. That's like having strain in the X is equal to stress in the X divided by E minus the Poisson effect of stress in the Z divided by E from our previous slide notation. Okay, so a little formula there that will allow us to work out the longitudinal strain, don't forget strain is extension of original length, in the longitudinal direction, in the actual direction, if you like. So that could be useful if you want to work out the strains in that direction, and maybe the, the change in length. We continue with the dimensional change in thin cylinder length here. Now we know that change in length, I'm using lowercase delta there, delta L, is the longitudinal strain, the epsilon L, multiplied by the original lengths. What I could do is, is use that equation and I can superimpose on that the longitudinal strain from the previous slide. So I can take this equation for epsilon L here, equation 14, and I can put it into this equation here for epsilon L and it will actually give me equation 15. This equation here for delta L is the same as on the previous slide, it's just we're multiplying by the lengths. If you look at the previous slide, we've got the stress L upon E minus the Poisson effect of the stress H upon E. E is a common factor there, you could take that outside of a bracket if you want to, which is what's been done here. So inside the bracket we've got the sigma L minus mu sigma H, all divided by E. So anything different about that equation between uh, 15 and 14 is that we've multiplied by L. And if you multiply a strain, the longitudinal strain, multiply it by the lengths, you'll get the change in lengths, the delta L. This is delta L here. And if you want to, we can also, a bit more complicated here, but we could put the, uh, could change the uh, uh, stress in the, in the longitudinal direction to PD upon 40, which is what's been done here. We can change the stress in the hoop direction there into PD upon 2T, which is done here for our sin cylinder. And we can derive equation 16, just a factorization there on the P and the D uh, on the top line. It's factorized on P and D here. It's common to both terms. Um, and on the bottom line, they factorized on four and put two on the top line here. Just a, just a rearrangement of equation 15, essentially, to produce equation 16. So we've got an equation 16 for the change in length of the vessel wall. And that's actually in terms of the uh, parameters of the wall, the, the diameters, the thicknesses, so and the geometry of the wall. So equation 15 relates to working out the change in length in terms of the stresses. Um, and equation 16 relates to working out the change in lengths in terms of the pressures, diameters, thicknesses. Okay, it does the same, same thing, just depends on the information you're given in the questions to which is best to use. So that's a, a, a way of calculating the change in lengths of a cylinder using our elastic constant theory. Let's now consider the 
dimensional change of a thin cylinder, but it's on, of course, the diameter here. Okay. So dimensional change in diameter of a thin cylinder, which is subject to internal pressure, is determined from the hoop or the circumferential strain. And again, we're always assuming negligible radial stress here. So let me just take you through this uh, little expression. It simplifies quite nicely, but initially a bit more complicated to consider. If we consider the cylinder hoop strain, epsilon h here, now the strain in the hoop direction, that's like the circumference, the circumferential strain, the epsilon h would be the change in the circumference over the original circumference. Because don't forget, the hoop stress relates to the um, circumferential uh, stresses and circumferential strains. So if we're considering the hoop strain, it's a change in the circumference over the original circumference. Now, the change in circumference would be the final circumference. So that would be the original diameter plus the change in diameter multiplied by pi, that would be the new circumference. And from that, we'd have to uh, subtract then the original circumference, which would be pi d, pi times the original diameter. If we divide that by pi d, the original diameter, we would get the strain. You could notice straight away, if you could say the pi is in every term, you can actually cancel the pi's straight away. I've got a pi in that term, a pi in that term, so they could cancel with the pi on the bottom. And then if you look at the what's left on the top line, I've got d plus delta d minus d. So you can see that the d's actually cancel. That capital D there, if I cancel with that capital D there. So I simply get left with delta d on the top line over the original diameter. So what that little um, derivation is trying to show you there is that the hoop strain the change in circumference over the original circumference can actually be equated to the diametrical strain. The hoop strain, epsilon h, is the same as the diametrical strain, if you call it epsilon d if you want to. Epsilon d is simply the change in the diameter over the original diameter. That would be the same as the change in circumference over the original circumference. final derivation to consider relates to the change in internal volume of the cylinder. This is here, not the cylinder wall, but the internal volume of the cylinder. So looking at my notation I'm using this particular slide, I'm showing the strain in the x direction as the longitudinal strain here. A strain in the y direction, this particular instance is the hoop strain. So strain in the y direction there is the hoop strain. And the strain in the z direction on my internal diameter would also be the hoop strain. All right, and just think through that carefully. We're considering here the uh, internal volume of the cylinder here. So we'd have a, a, be a change in length, um, change in the x direction. There'll be a change in diameter in the y direction and there'll be a change in diameter in the z direction. So we get strains in all those directions in this particular case. So my strain in the y and strain in the z, as I've labelled them on my diagram there, will be the same in this case. And of course, we're always assuming the radial stress is negligible. So if I was to calculate the volumetric strain here for the uh, particular vessel here, if I want to work out what the epsilon v is, this is, this is volumetric strain. If you go again back to our elastic constant work, that just meant adding up three strains. We had a big derivation. If, if you go back to the previous um, lecture on elastic constants, quite a derivation to derive volumetric strain. But basically, it boiled down to, in the end, simply adding up the three strains in a mutual orthogonal direction, strain in the x, strain in the y, strain in the z. So in this case, my strain in the x added to my uh, strain in the y added to my strain in the z, so adding those three strains up gives me the volumetric strain, but in a thin cylinder situation, our actual volumetric strain would be the strain in the longitudinal direction, that's the x, we add that to the strain in the y direction, that would be the hoop strain, strain on diameter, and of course the strain in the z direction, in this case, would be the strain in the hoop, uh, and diametrical strain. So in actual fact, when we're calculating the volumetric strain for the inside of a thin cylinder, it simplifies in this particular case to the strain in the longitudinal direction added to twice the strain in the hoop direction, because our strain in the Y is the same as the strain in Z in this case. I said on the previous slide, sometimes we label the strain in the hoop direction, we sometimes label that uh, as epsilon d, sometimes that's the term that way. So we can actually replace uh, that with epsilon d here if we want to. Okay. So our basically our, our volumetric strain can be defined as strain in the uh, longitudinal direction plus twice the strain 
on diameter. So considering the change in internal volume of the sin cylinder here, we can determine the relationship uh, for the change in internal volume of a thin walled cylinder by considering the elastic constants um, and specifically for volumetric strain. So we are calling volumetric strain epsilon v from our previous work on elastic constants. As I said, volumetric strain is the addition of the three mutual orthogonal strains um, in our vessel wall epsilon x epsilon y epsilon z and as i shown on the previous slide because epsilon y and epsilon z in this case are the same the diametrical strains our volumetric strain for a cylinder can simplify to epsilon v is the strain in the longitudinal direction plus twice strain in the hoop or diametrical direction so that's how we get equation 22 if we consider our equation 22 and we just insert in that equation the the actual formulas for longitudinal and hoop stress, we can generate another equation. So from this page here, from this equation here, the epsilon L plus 2 epsilon D equation for our volume, we've got epsilon V is, that's the epsilon L is actually the stress in the longitudinal direction divided by E. And that's minus the Poisson effect of the stress in the hoop direction divided by E. So that would be my strain in the L direction. And then I've got twice the strain in the diametrical direction. And again, if you put the formulas in for that, that will be twice the stress in the hoop direction divided by E uh, minus twice the uh, Poisson effect of the strain in the L direction divided by E. All they're doing is putting in for the uh, stress in the L and stress in the H. So just putting in the values of PD upon 2T and PD upon 4T. So there's my stress in the L direction. It's uh, inserted into the equation, so that goes into there, stress in the L direction. And there's my uh, stress over there coming in, inserted. So you don't have to worry too much about this. But this is what's happening. I'm just putting in the stresses into the equation here. And then simplify the equation algebraically. Okay, so uh, they end up basically with a formula for volumetric strain, which is shown here. Volumetric strain, the epsilon v. Simplifying the above, it's just purely algebraic rearrangement and factorising. Uh, is PD upon 40E multiplied by in brackets 5 minus 4 nu. That's what the uh, derivation shows us. And if we know that volumetric strain is change in volume divided by original volume, which of course is what it is, then we can actually uh, rearrange our equation. We have this equation above. We can actually have the change in volume is going to be the volume, the original volume, uh, multiplied by this expression here to give us equation 26. So again, don't worry too much about the proof. It's, it is reasonably um, clear to follow there if you want to follow in detail. But it's that final formula that's quite useful. We want to find the change in volume. This is internal volume, don't forget. Uh, we're considering not, not the vessel wall itself, but the internal volume of a sin cylinder. Uh, equation 26 will help us find that if we need to. So there's all your formulae that we need to derive. This is a summary of them here. So that's the formulas that we're playing with. The questions will be asking us to find different parameters, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to use the various equations to, to find those, okay? So that's a useful little slide we might refer to. Okay. So let's go through some questions. All I want to do now is work through lots of questions. Uh, question one here I can see straight away it's bringing in the weld efficiencies, so we need to be aware of that. But basically it wants us to uh, work out allowable pressure given various parameters, kind of things we did last week. So, so to begin with, we're going to sort of warm ourselves up with these kind of questions, all right? So question 1b asks us to determine the maximum allowable pressure in a boiler shell that has a diameter of 3 metres and a wall thickness of 25 millimetres. We're given the allowable working stress, that's a stress it can work up to every day of its life, so the uh, working stress in this case is not to exceed 60 megapascals effectively there, and we're given some joint efficiencies here. The joints are assumed to be 60% efficient, so all the welds, circumferential or longitudinal welds, have a 60% efficiency. Do you want to have a little go at that? It's very similar to the exercise 3 anyway. It's just that you've got to transpose the equation to find a pressure in this particular case. I'm going to go back to the equation on the previous slide here, uh, which equation you're going to use where you're, you're considering a cylinder here. So the maximum stress in the cylinder relates to the hoop stress. So um, I would encourage you to uh, be considering this equation and rearrange that equation to find the pressure, P, 
um, given all the other parameters here you've got. See if you can solve the first exercise. There's a question that's 0 0.6 megapascals is the internal pressure. So 6 bar, if you want to work in bar, it would be 6 bar. Okay, question 1B, solution. There you go. You'll notice in all my calculations that I show you, I actually undertake this uh, check for D upon T ratio, because obviously we need to make sure we we comply with the requirements that the D upon T is greater than 20. You don't need to do that because all the questions I'm going to give you will be thin synergies. But of course, in the real world, you'd have to be, uh, you know, be careful that, it, that the parameters are, um, are acceptable. So, uh, so in this case, uh, the actual D upon T ratio, 120 it says here, so much greater than 20 in this case. So I've, my finance, I put it in kilopascals here for some reason, don't know why. Uh, so 0 0.6 megapascals you could use. I put it 600 kilopascals. If you could state it in bar if you wanted to, 6 bar. Okay, question 2b. We've got to calculate the minimum shell thickness required for a Lancashire boiler of 2,500 millimetres internal diameter. And the pressure is 14 bar. Internal pressure is 14 bar. We're given the permissible stress. And it's not to exceed 50 megapascals. Our joint efficiency, 65%. So quite a bit of information there. So be careful with the information. You've got the boiler diameter in terms of millimetres. You've got the pressure in terms of bar. You've got the working stress in terms of megapascals. So... Again, these are all little issues we have to deal with. Um, be consistent with your units. I think the easiest thing there probably is to put the diameter in terms of uh, meters and put the pressure in terms of pascals. But I'll leave it to you what you want to do. But basically, you've got to rearrange the equation to find the uh, thickness in this case. Question 2b is the full solution. Now, I suggested on the previous slide to convert your diameter into meters. That would reduce the number of conversions required as your permitted stress is actually given in 50 megapascals in the question. But here you can see I kept my diameter in terms of millimetres, so I had to convert my pressures and stresses into millimetres. So the pressure in the question was stated as 14 bar, that's 1.4 newtons per millimetre squared. The working stress in the question was stated as 50 times 10 to the 6 newtons per metre squared. That converts to 50 newtons per millimetre squared. And of course, that's the hoop stress. That's the maximum stress in the vessel. And the weld efficiency is given is 65%. So that's 0 0.65 in decimal. Using the hoop stress in the cylinder wall equation, we transpose for T. And then inserting the values, T calculates to be 53.85 millimetres, so approximately 54 millimetres. Notice I did check the D upon T ratio just to ensure I complied with thin cylinder theory. So D of 2,500 millimetres divided by normally 54 millimetres, about 46 D upon T ratio. So much greater than 20 in thin cylinder theory applies. So we've got question three. We've got to calculate the maximum allowable diameter for a spherical vessel here, so a spherical pressure vessel, a nuclear reactor. It contains carbon dioxide at a pressure of 10 bar gauge, all our pressure is a gauge anyway. The tensile stress in the shell wall is not to exceed 75 megapascals. And the maximum thickness of the vessel is going to be 75 millimetres. It's trying to find diameter, but bear in mind we're considering a spherical vessel here. So um, use the appropriate equation. Question 3b solution. So my diameter for my spherical vessel was about 22.5 meters. And again, I did check my D upon T ratio here. It's very large, 300. So uh, very much greater than 20 here. Question 4b, question 4b, spherical copper shell, 600 millimetres in internal diameter, has to withstand an internal pressure of 20 bar without the stress 
in the copper exceeding 60 newtons per millimeter squared here, so a slightly different unit used. We've got to evaluate the thickness of the shell, assuming the joint efficiency is 80% in this case. I think once you've already done that one actually, haven't you? So it's question 4B solution. I calculated my thickness to be 6.25 millimeters. Just be careful with the information from the question. In that particular case, my 20 bar, the 20 bar given in the question, I put that in terms of newtons per millimeter squared. So that's two newtons per millimeter squared. So I'm working ever since there were millimeters here because the actual stress given in the question was in newtons per millimeter squared. And also it's a spherical vessel, of course. So I've got the four in the formula here for the hoop stress. But my, um, my thickness was 6.25 millimeters. And check the upon t ratio, it was 96, so thin cylinder theory applies again. In question 5b, so we got a cylindrical air receiver for a compressor, 2 meters internal diameter, manufactured from 50 millimeter thick plate. The maximum hoot stress is not to exceed 90 megapascals and the actual stress is not to exceed 60 megapascals. Got to determine the maximum safe pressure here. Question 5b, here's a solution. Again I've checked my Dupont T ratio, very much greater than 20 in this case, so it's 2 meters divided by the 0 0.015 meters, the hoop stress and the longitudinal stress are given. So rearranging my hoop stress formula for the pressure, that works out to give me 1.35 megapascals or 13.5 bar. And then rearranging my longitudinal stress equation, I find the pressure is 1.8 megapascals or 18 bar. So in this case, the maximum internal pressure has to be limited to the 13.5 bar based on the hoop stress calculation. Question 6b is quite an interesting little problem. It's to do with a sort of shrink fit, and it's, initially it seems quite complicated, but actually if you read the question carefully, it's, um, it's uh, just the context It's a bit more confusing here. So a bronze sleeve, 80 millimeters internal diameter, six millimeters thickness, is a force fit onto a solid steel shaft. The force flitting of the sleeve on the shaft subjects it to an internal radial pressure. And then from strain gauge readings, measurement of hoop strain induced, corresponded to 96 megapascals. So we're going to calculate the radial pressure between the sleeve and the shaft. So basically what they've given you there is a hoop stress really. From the strain gauge readings they've converted a stress using our elastic constant theory and that's given us the hoop stress to use in our equation to find the pressure that the sleeve exerts on the shaft. So question 6b solution. So that's a quite straightforward calculation, but literally the context is a bit more confusing because it's talking about a shrink fit here. I worked ever since in millimetres in this particular case, for some reason I don't know why. So my 96 megapascals was 96 newtons per millimetre squared in my case. Question 7b. A thin spherical vessel contains 88 metres cubed of gas at a pressure of 1.4 newtons per millimeter squared. The stress that's induced within the vessel wall must not exceed 120 megapascals. We're asked to calculate the internal diameter of the vessel and the thickness of the plate required. The question's given us the volume of a sphere for our reference. Answers are shown in the brackets here. I encourage you to stop the presentation, attempt the question, but the full work solution is shown on the following slide. Question 7b is the full solution. 
We're given in the question the initial internal volume, 88 meters cubed. I've actually converted that straight away into millimeters cubed using my unity bracket here. So that's 88 times 10 to the 9 millimeters cubed. The internal pressure is given, 1.4 newtons per millimeter squared. And the working stress is given as 120 megapascals. I've converted that to 120 newtons per millimeter squared. And of course, that's the hoop stress, the maximum stress in the vessel wall. The question wants us to find the vessel diameter and the vessel wall thickness. So part one, to find the vessel diameter, we're given the initial volume. So using the equation pi d cubed upon 6, the volume of the sphere, we can rearrange to find the diameter of the sphere, and that works to be 5,518.8 millimetres. Part 2, we're asked to find the wall thickness of the spherical vessel. So we know that the hoop stress in a spherical vessel is PD upon 4T, so rearranging from T, inserting the values, we find the wall thickness T is 16.1 millimetres. If you check the D upon T ratio for that particular vessel, it's about 343, so we're well into thin cylinder theory territory. Question 11b. A thin stainless steel cylinder has a diameter of 50 millimetres, a wall thickness of 3 millimetres, and is 200 millimetres long. The cylinder is subjected to an internal pressure of 10 megapascals, and all weld joint efficiencies are assumed to be 100%. If the material has an ultimate tensile strength of 475 megapascals, a Young's modulus of 195 gigapascals, and a Poisson's ratio of 0.3, we've got to determine the following. A, the principal stresses, the hoop and longitudinal stress, B, the factor of safety against the ultimate tensile strength. C, the change in cylinder length. D, the change in internal diameter. And E, the change in internal volume. Answers are shown in the brackets below. So if we just think through what we need to find here, we need the principal stresses for a cylinder, so we'll need to find the hoop stress given this equation and of course the longitudinal stress given this equation. In part B we have to find a factor of safety so knowing the hoop stress in the cylinder that's a stress in the wall and knowing from the question the ultimate tensile strengths we can find the factor of safety against the ultimate tensile strengths. We're asked to find the change in cylinder length so that's the delta L shown here the change in internal diameter, we can find the change in diameter from this equation. And finally, we need to calculate the change in internal volume, and that's calculated from this formula here. So that's our plan of attack through the problem. Question 11B solution. So working out my hoop stress for part A, my principal stress is... My hoop stress, get 83.4 meganewtons meter squared. It wants a longitudinal stress, so that's just going to be half the hoop stress in this case because there's no weld efficiencies to work, consider, so half the longitudinal stress. I need to work out my volume here because I'll need that later on, so my actual original volume. Put it in meters cubed here. Interesting to note in this particular question, the D upon T ratio was actually slightly less in 20, but even so, you would still apply sin cylinder theory to it. It's still reasonable. Question 11b continued. Factor of safety. Just the ultimate tensile strength divided by the maximum principal stress, which is the hoop stress in this case, the 83 and a third megapascal, so I get a 5.7 for my factor of safety. It's a nice chunky factor of safety. And for my change in length of the cylinder, delta L, I get 17.095 micrometers. And so what's the change in length there? Question 11b final. Parts here and to the solution. Part D, changing cylinder diameter. 
just use the appropriate equation. And again, very small change, 18.164 micrometers, change in diameter. And the final part was to find the change in cylinder volume, delta V. Just notice we have to use the original volume, which I calculated previously. So use the original volume there, calculate the change in volume. Again, very small change, 313. 0.86 times 10 to the negative 9 meters cubed. Question 13b. A thin cylinder has an internal diameter of 240 millimeters, a wall thickness of 1.5 millimeters, and is 1.2 meters long. The cylinder's material has an elastic modulus E of 210 Giga Newtons per meter squared and a Poisson's ratio nu of 0.3. If the internal volume change is found to be 14 times 10 to negative 6 meters cubed when pressurized and the joint efficiencies of the welds are assumed to be in the longitudinal direction 85% efficient, in the circumferential direction 55% efficient, we're asked to calculate A, the volumetric strain, B, the value of the pressure, and C, the hoop and longitudinal stresses. Answers shown in the brackets here. I'd encourage you to stop the presentation and attempt this question, but the full work solution is shown on the following slide. Question 13b, here's the full solution. Part A, we're calculating the volumetric strain. We're given in the question that the diameter is 240 millimetres. I've put down to metres here. The thickness is 1.5 millimetres, again converted to metres here. Just checking the D upon T ratio, that works out to be 160, so it's much greater than 20, so our thin cylinder theory applies. The length given in the question is 1.2 metres. So we've got the geometry, we can find the cylinder volume V, so the original volume of the cylinder is 0.0543 metres cubed. The weld joint efficiencies are given, longitudinal weld is 85% efficient, that's 0.85, and the hoop or circumferential weld is 55% efficient, so 0.55. Young's modulus is given, the E is 210 times 10 to 9 newtons per meter squared, and also the Poisson ratio nu is given. The question also states the change in volume, delta V, under the pressure, it's 14 times 10 to negative 6 meters cubed. So for part A, to find the volumetric strain, Epsilon V, that's simply the change in volume divided by the original volume. We're given the change in volume in the question. The original volume we've calculated above. So the volumetric strain is 257.8 times 10 to negative 6. Question 13b, solution continued. Part B, we're asked to find the value of this pressure. Pressure relates to part A of the question. So we know from the previous work that change in volume is given by this expression we derived earlier, so we can transpose to find the pressure. So pressure equals, inserting the values, that would be 3.562 bar. Part C, we're asked to calculate the hoop stress. That's PD upon 2T E to L. Don't forget the longitudinal efficiency affects the hoop stress. So the hoop stress is equal to the pressure calculated part B, multiplied by the diameter, given in the question, and that's divided by 2, multiplied by the thickness, multiplied by the longitudinal weld efficiency of 0.85. That evaluates to 33.54 megapascals. We're also asked to calculate the longitudinal stress, sigma L, so that's PD upon 40 eta H, again the Longitudinal stress is affected by the circumferential weld efficiency. The only thing that's different here is the 4 for the longitudinal stress formula and the weld efficiency is 0.55. That evaluates to 25.91 megapascals. I will leave you with some questions to attempt at your own pace. Question 16b. The context here is a reservoir located at A in our picture, and a generating station located at B, shown here. We're given that the density of water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed, 
and we're asked to determine the maximum normal stress and the maximum shearing stress in the pipe under static conditions at location B here. There's a hint in the question that pressure is equal to rho GH. So pressure due to the head of the fluid in the reservoir is rho GH. Note that the rho symbol in the equation here relates to density of water. Answers are shown in the brackets. I'd encourage you to attempt this question. Question 21, we're asked to calculate A, the change in diameter, and B, the change in length of a thin cylinder shell of wall thickness 20 millimetres, diameter 1500 millimetres, and length 8 metres, when it's subjected to an internal pressure of 12 megapascals. The E and the new values are stated. Answers are shown in the brackets on the right hand side. I'd encourage you to attempt this question. Question 28b. A pressure measuring device consists of a thin walled steel tube, 50 millimetres in diameter, having strain gauges attached to measure the circumferential strain. If the maximum pressure to be measured is 50 bar, We've got to determine a suitable wall thickness for the cylinder such that the maximum stress does not exceed half of the initial yield stress. Assuming a vessel is constructed to the above dimensions, what's the internal pressure when the strain gauge measures 250 microstrain? We're given in the question the elastic modulus E, the Poisson's ratio nu, and also the yield stress sigma y. Answers are shown in the brackets on the right hand side. So following the process through, you'll need to calculate the vessel wall thickness, and from the given strain in the question, we can calculate the internal pressure applied. For your reference, here's the bibliography used to help develop this presentation. I hope this has been of interest to you and thank you for viewing.